Hello, uh, my name is Michael Hennessy, and I'm from Wright State University, and I would like to thank ASB for inviting me to present results from a study I did with Katie Chun and John Capitanio of the California National Primate Research Center. The experiment examined how we might be able to use a non-human primate model to study the effects of social separation on depression without need for the extreme procedures usually associated with such studies. Major depressive disorder is a devastating mental condition and the leading cause of disability worldwide. By far the most common environmental antecedent associated with the onset of depression is stress, and stress derived from social isolation or loneliness appears to be particularly insidious in this regard. The impact of these social stressors can be long lasting. In children, neglect, abuse, or other forms of attachment disruption can increase vulnerability for depression over the lifetime. The process by which this occurs appears to involve the early stress sensitizing underlying neurobiological or other stress responsive systems so that stressors experienced in later life have a disproportionately larger effect and are more likely to then trigger a depressive episode. Very early non-human primate studies were instrumental in establishing the critical impact of social isolation or separation from attachment figures on the onset of depression. But these studies, which were conducted primarily by Harlow and his associates and students, involved procedures such as isolation rearing and prolonged separation of infants from their mothers that clearly are inconsistent with today's standards of animal welfare and care. Stressors can often elicit a widespread immune reaction involving release of pro-inflammatory signalers or cytokines that in the brain can produce a behavioral syndrome referred to as sickness. Sickness is marked by inactivity, disinterest in the environment, and a characteristic hunched or crouched posture. While sickness in humans is not considered depression, the symptoms of sickness and depression do overlap, and it is thought that an intense or prolonged bout of sickness can segue into a depressive episode. In other words, sickness appears to be a transitional state that can precede the onset of inflammatory-induced depression. Inflammation may also account the long-term effects of severe social stress on increasing vulnerability to develop depressive illness later in life. That is, many believe that the inflammatory reaction is one of the stress systems that sensitizes over time so that more minor stressors become capable of inducing larger inflammatory reactions and ultimately depression. Nonetheless, it is a big jump from rodent models, which have formed the basis for these hypotheses, to depressed patients. Ethically sound non-human primate studies that could test hypotheses generated in rodents could go a long way for determining the relevance of these rodent findings for humans, and they would be valuable for further examining how inflammation produces its depressive genic effects. The challenge here then is to find a way to model these effects in monkeys without returning to the extreme procedures such as prolonged isolation of infants that was common 50 years ago. One possibility arose in conversations with Dr. Brenda McGowan, head of the behavioral management team at the California National Primate Research Center. In routine observations of rhesus macaques moved from large outdoor social groups to indoor housing, her staff had occasionally reported seeing a hunched stance reminiscent of both the posture of sick animals and of the separated infants of years ago. In contrast, in outdoor social groups, this posture was essentially non-existent in healthy animals. Additional insight came from videotapes scored for another purpose for an experiment by Dr. John Capitanio of the California Center. 26 adult male monkeys had been brought from outdoor social groups to indoor individual housing and were briefly filmed during their first two weeks indoors. While the prevalence of the hunched posture in direct observations by Dr. McGowan's team was low, review of Dr. Capitanio's tapes, which were made when no human was in the housing unit, revealed that 18 of the 26 adult males brought from outdoor social groups to indoor individual housing displayed the hunched posture in just 20 minutes of videotaping over the two-week period. It seemed then that adult rhesus, at least males, were particularly prone to display this depressive-like behavior pattern when no human was in the room. We also suspected that the behavioral response might be mediated by an inflammatory reaction. That is, it may represent an example of a stress-induced sickness response elicited by the stressor of a change in housing and absence of social companions. 
We suspected this both because an earlier study by Felger and colleagues in 2007 had found that macaques injected with a pro-inflammatory cytokine showed what appeared to be the same hunched posture, and because our own work with guinea pigs had demonstrated that a similar behavioral reaction, that is an immobile crouch stance that occurs during social isolation, could be reduced with anti-inflammatory treatment. If in fact these speculations were true, then perhaps what essentially is a common animal husbandry procedure, that is bringing animals from outdoor social groups to indoor housing for relatively short periods of time, may provide a means of studying some of the mechanisms by which isolation can induce depression and perhaps its sensitization. At this point, however, our argument was based as much on assumptions and speculation as on hard evidence. To begin with, all of our data had been collected retrospectively from earlier notes and experimentation. Further, there was no evidence that the change in housing induced um, an inflammatory reaction, much less one that was related to the behavioral response. We also had no idea of whether the response would sensitize with repeated bouts of indoor housing, as has been hypothesized to occur when early life stress increases vulnerability to the later onset of depression. Finally, we did not know if the actual social deprivation associated with the move was what uh, contributed to the behavioral effect of being brought indoors. Therefore, we conducted a study with two groups of adult male rhesus macaques. Each was brought either alone or with a partner from spacious outdoor social groups to individual indoor housing for eight days. Monkeys were subsequently returned to the outdoor field cage for two weeks and then brought back indoors for a second eight-day round of housing. All males to be included in the study were determined to have a younger companion that they, they interacted with amiably in the outdoor field cages. We then randomly assigned adult males to either the alone or with partner condition. While monkeys in the alone condition were housed individually, those in the with partner condition were housed indoors with their younger affiliative partner. Behavior was observed for 20 minutes a day on days 2, 4, 6, and 8 of indoor housing. Blood samples were collected for measures of inflammation prior to each round when monkeys were captured from the outdoor field cages and then again at the end of the eighth day indoors. Two pro-inflammatory cytokines, interleukin-1 beta, IL-1 beta, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, or TNF-alpha, and one anti-inflammatory cytokine, IL-10, were examined. In addition to circulating levels, we also assessed measures found to be altered in depression-prone adolescent girls who had undergone harsh early rearing conditions. First, we looked at whether the indoor housing increased cytokine expression following an inflammatory challenge. We induced the inflammatory challenge by adding the immune activator, lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, to blood samples that had been collected from the monkeys. Second, we assessed whether the housing change reduced the ability of glucocorticoids to suppress the cytokine response in blood samples containing LPS. Blood samples for cortisol analysis were collected from the field cages and on days 1, 3, and 8 indoors. We found that every monkey in both groups displayed the hunched, depressive-like posture during both rounds of housing. In fact, monkeys of both groups spent about a third of the observation periods in the hunched posture during the first round of indoor housing. For individually housed monkeys, this response sensitized, almost doubling in duration from the first to the second round. The presence of an affiliative partner buffered the, the behavioral reaction by preventing sensitization from occurring. The sensitization of the depressive-like posture was accompanied by reductions in exploration and movement measures that typically are reduced during sickness. Observations of another group of males in the outdoor field cages confirmed that the hunched posture did not occur there except for brief periods of less than 90 seconds and these were in the course of social interactions such as grooming. The differential change in behavior across the two rounds occurred, occurred together with a differential response of the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10 to LPS stimulation. There was a significant interaction between condition and round of housing, whereas there was a relative reduction from round 1 to 2 in IL-10 in the individually housed monkeys, there was a relative increase in IL-10 in pair housed animals. In other words, sensitization of depressive-like behavior was associated with a relative reduction of this anti-inflammatory peptide. 
table illustrates the effect of LPS challenge on the pro-inflammatory cytokines IL-1 beta and TNF alpha. First, it is obvious that LPS challenge produced an enormous increase in cytokines, whether the blood was collected from animals in outdoor field cages or following indoor housing. The only effective housing condition was a moderate impact on IL-1 beta that was the opposite uh, as predicted. That is, there was a smaller rather than a larger activation when housed indoors. What appeared more dramatic, however, was the effect of indoor housing on the ability of glucocorticoids to suppress the cytokine response. As one would expect, when progressively larger doses of the glucocorticoid dexamethasone were added to blood samples spiked with LPS, there was a progressive decline in the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. This effect was clearest when monkeys were captured in the outdoor field cages. But after eight days indoors, there was loss of sensitivity to the anti-inflammatory action of glucocorticoids so that the higher doses had less suppressive effect on pro-inflammatory cytokine levels. Plasma cortisol levels themselves peaked during the first day indoors and had returned to field cage values in both groups by day eight. So although cortisol levels were equivalent from samples collected in the field cage and following eight days of indoor housing, the ability of glucocorticoids to suppress immune activation had weakened following housing indoors. Finally, we found a relation for individually housed monkeys between cytokine levels and the depressive-like behavioral response. As seen here, plasma levels of each cytokine during each round showed a significant and positive association with the number of seconds spent in the hunched depressive-like posture. Interestingly, if the animals were housed with an affiliative partner, these correlations were uniformly negative and non-significant. Summarize the main results. Simply moving monkeys from outdoor social groups to individual indoor housing reliably produced a depressive-like behavioral response that was positively associated with circulating cytokine levels. This behavioral outcome likely represented sickness behavior, which is believed to be an initial transitional step to inflammatory-induced depression in humans. The depressive-like behavior sensitized, as has been hypothesized, to occur in people. The sensitization occurred together with a relative reduction in anti-inflammatory response. Though LPS stimulation effects for one cytokine were greater in field cage housed animals, indoor housing reduced the sensitivity of both pro-inflammatory cytokines to glucocorticoid suppression. Such reduced sensitivity is a mechanism proposed to underlie increased vulnerability to depression in humans who have undergone earlier social stress. Clearly more work needs to be done, such as the inclusion of females and examining monkeys undergoing differing early life experience. Nonetheless, we are hopeful that this procedure will provide a practical means by which links between social isolation and depressive illness can be investigated in a non-human primate without resorting to the extreme procedures of years past. I would like to thank those who helped out in various aspects of the project and to the NIMH for funding it. Thank you.